Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at some changes to the AAA slash FLAC that we have over here in Command Modern Operations. So what I've done is I've gone over to the Achillic testing range. For those of you who are not familiar with this region, now this is basically where the former Soviet Union slash Russia would test out all their latest and greatest surface air missile systems, and hey, hey, why not? So what I've done is I've put together a kind of like a little range here, kind of a thing like that, in a huge array of these lovely KS-19s. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the KS-19, you probably weren't flying F-4 Phantoms over North Vietnam during the uh, 1960s and 70s. This is kind of the go-to anti-aircraft gun. There's also the KS-12, which is a little bit smaller. And then if you want something extremely bizarre, well, not bizarre, but like, oh my god, what the heck, you have the lovely KS-30, which is a 130 millimeter flat gun. These things are huge. Now, for those of you who've been keeping track of the latest and greatest changes over in the command universe, I mean, they've been cranking these things out one per week, I swear. They've actually adjusted the way that flak works. And instead of you get hit and it does one damage, now there's a different probability, a sliding scale of how clean of a hit that you had. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with these kinds of weapons, uh, basically what you're going to do is you're going to launch a shell. The shell is going to try to go within a certain proximity of a target, usually an air target, and it's going to go curse blowy, and it's basically going to shatter it with shrapnel. Now keep in mind, just like depth charges, these were not pinpoint precise weapons. Those of you who are fans of all sorts of World War II games, you've probably seen these little flak bursts all around you, and you probably know it's not the one flak burst that gets you, although of course if you get cleanly hit with a piece of flak, it's going to take a hole and it's going to snap you in two. Uh, those of you who fly at uh, DCS, if you've ever been uh, smacked in the face by one of those, you just go and explode. But the important thing here is, is the accumulation of damage over time is what makes flak semi-effective. Now, of course, uh, when we started getting things like jets that could travel five, six hundred miles an hour, it suddenly became very, very challenging to actually use flak well because it was just it was just moving too fast. By the time the shrapnel got moving, the target was already gone. And then, of course, there's the targeting challenges of actually trying to line up those shots and make them land. One of the things that they changed in a recent build, and you can see, <laughs> I have a little cha-cha line of aircraft approaching us here for my demonstration. Uh, one of the big things they changed is now made it so that, like I was saying, it's not a clean hit anymore. It could be a dead hit. It could be a nearby hit. It could be a near miss, which I'm pretty sure all hits are near misses. Isn't that how that works? The important thing to know, though, is if I were to click on one of these, just to make sure that this weapon is capable of this, if you're actually able to go down to the actual weapon, you can see KS-19 Rag. Uh, that's the weapon you're looking for. And when you click on it, you'll actually notice that it's got this special fuse proximity. Now, one of the problems with flak back in World War II is the gun crews actually firing the flak had to basically predict the altitude and distance of the target when the flak shell needed to explode. That's challenging, especially if you didn't have high-precision radar, which they didn't. But what they did have is they had the old school range finders and a bunch of calculations. Of course, you had things like B-17s all traveling in a big fat group, all moving at the same speed direction with each other to make it easier. Now, what the Americans actually created, which was a really wild invention at the time, was called the variable timing shell, a VT shell, for those of you who want to check that out later on. And what they did is they put a radar in the nose of the shell. And what would happen is as the uh, shell is cruising out, it's constantly scanning, scanning. Oh, I just detected a Doppler shift, and then it would explode. Those shells were so top secret at the time, they refused to use them in Europe because they were afraid that somebody would find an unexploded shell and turn that technology back on the Allies, which is why they used them in the Pacific exclusively, just as a way, because, you know, if they land in the water, probably they're not going to fish them out, kind of a thing like that. Enough chat, let's get to the action here. So what I've done is I've created a cha-cha line of all these different aircraft that are approaching us right now. Now, what these aircraft are, I'm going to click on one. These are MD-11 drones. Yes, they're drones. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fly them over the top of our lovely little uh, kind of range here. And my objective here is to demonstrate to you how altitude has a massive impact on the overall effectiveness and so that you can see the actual mechanics of that weapon as it cruises through. So now 1,000 feet, uh, that's uh, not terribly high. Uh, for those of you who see him, he's moving about 250 knots here. Uh, one thing that kind of surprises me is I believe I told him to fly a minimum altitude. Uh, we'll go order him to minimum altitude. Unfortunately, minimum altitude in an airliner is... Um, kind of low put him to zero yeah 20 feet let's see if it goes any lower yes you just got to be careful when you do those uh, manual ones there all right so he's closing down so these crews right now are working out the uh, equations and calculations to take the shot you can see there are plenty of things detecting them i have a whole field here like i said i tried to design this pretty effectively so what's going to happen is let me open up the message log here uh, one of the cool quick tips here let me go ahead and open my message log real fast is if you click in the upper right corner, or left corner, this is raw button here, this is super helpful. And uh, one of the things that I actually like to do is I like to pop it out. 
Uh, the reason I like to do this like this is because it allows you to kind of have a separate screen for this. And uh, for those of you who have a big screens here, it works really, really well. But what I want to do here, and the reason why I'm pulling this down here like this, is I want to be able to show you what the kind of final little actions are as this particular projectiles start to do their magic. Now remember, this guy's cruising at 500 feet. Uh, 500 feet is not very high. And of course, there goes the first couple shots. And we have, oh, okay, pause. Okay, so now uh, we took our first shot here. Now what you're gonna notice here is a lot of data that has just come out here. You can see our accuracy changes. Uh, you can see the actual how it doesn't adjust for altitude, adjust for proficiency, aircraft is a weight of this and all those things. But you're also gonna notice now that we have this little piece that says proximity fuse gun 81 to 150. Probability of hit has been increased by four. Target is subsonic, no alteration effective probability hit. This now means our little flak shot that we just took here was actually adjusted based on the fact that it is a proximity shell. And you can see that when we fired, we had a little explosion where all sorts of stuff came peppering all around that particular target. We actually did hit it and we did do damage to it. Now, if I switch over to the drone side real quick and I click on this guy real quick, you'll notice here, uh, let's see here, we want a uh, weapon end game here. I don't want this, Boop, that's a weapon end game. And you'll see that it's attacking, it's a miss, a miss, a miss, a miss, a miss. No alteration in flak hit, but you can see we got a result of a one here, which has caused a little bit of damage here to this particular one. Now this guy right here, normally those flak shells do, I believe it's something like one damage. You can see that our hit here basically speckled him. Uh, it did not snap him in two, it didn't blow him to pieces. He has a total uh, capacity here of damage, uh, pretty high. It's actually 20 damage points, which is one of the reasons why. But you'll notice his engine is aflame, from that hit that almost barely did not hit him. How's that for too many words in one place? Now, if I hit damage control, you can see I've lost one engine. There's a reason why I like this aircraft, because it has three engines. And uh, when you lose one, you don't tend to lose the other, but that fire's really, really bad. So let's go switch back over here. Here, I'm gonna go ahead and unpause. And you can see everybody's uh, joining in on the fun here, and uh, they're basically just speckling this thing. So even though traditionally that 1% chance, you'd pretty much never, ever, ever hit him, you can see very easily that uh, we were able to do quite a bit of damage Oh, that's the deflection shot. This one is the cleanest shot, though. Anybody who's firing straight in like that is going to be most likely. Now, notice here our probabilities of hit were increased because of that proximity shell, but just because we hit, it did not mean we did a substantially greater amount of damage. Now, one of the cool things, if I were to press Shift F1 and actually click on this one here, you can see here that um, we got ready to automatic fire, and you can just go ahead and take a shot there. One thing I will adjust real quickly here is I'll go ahead and I'll let them rip, and we'll go ahead and say let them rip again, and uh, we're just going to let them kind of fire away. One thing we do want to take a look at here is this all weapons kind of thing. This is a fire like this, fire to meet the salvo quantity. Of course, we can increase on how many people fire at that particular target. One thing I'm just confirming real quickly visually is you don't want them to not not fire. All right, you can see they just got cruise on by there. I don't know why they're not uh, firing. It seems like a pretty clean shot to me. But they're going to go ahead and do a quite a bit of damage. Take a few more shots as they kind of passes over there. Not bad. So now our next target that's arriving in just a few minutes here was a program to be 1,000 feet. So I would not say this guy got unscathed. Uh, he's a uh, four point. Okay, so he was able to put the fire out. So this is actually pretty good. So pretty good amount of damage, but very typical for a flak kind of run like that. You're not going to get through. You're probably not going to get blown up. But at the same time, as you're probably going to get hit a few times. So we have this one cruising through now, and we've got a lot of misses. Again, I would never want to fly through a gauntlet like this. And you can see the difference in altitude has halved the probability of a hit. Our low altitude guy at 500 feet was typically getting 12s. Uh, you're seeing in here a probability of hits are fours. Uh, there's probably a couple of threes, maybe a six or two in there. And you can see he actually got through my entire flak field completely unscathed. So this guy's coming in at 2,000 feet. Now this one's quite a bit higher. And you'll notice here that my probability of hit is the uh, same exact as it was a moment ago. You can see we're looking at a 4% probability. Some of those, if you notice that last couple bursts, eh, it's spec- Oh, no! Uh, it hit him pretty good there. Let's uh, go switch to the other side and see what happened. Oh, we have one of you with no comm. Um, he's no longer no comm. Uh, generic weather radar. Look at how little damage this was. You know, this particular hit that we suffered, I'm actually going to shut this off so you can see it very clearly. These hits here were not necessarily clean hits. You can see this one was 0 0.84. This one was 0 0.1. These well, we have 0 0.42, 0 0.84. Again, they're modified by how close the actual projectile was to hit. But notice our first victim here was actually, believe it or not, um, the guy who was at 2,000 feet. So now we'll go ahead and speed up time a little bit here. Let's continue with my little gauntlet exercise. This guy right here is uh, cruising in at, I believe he's 3,000 feet. Uh, he's coming through okay. Notice our probability to hit is uh, still 4%. So even though we've added 2,000 feet, 
our probability of hit has not changed dramatically. Here comes the next chap as I come running in. He's, <laughs> these guys are just going ham here. And again, we're attacking 5,000 feet here. 5,000 feet, notice my probability of hit stayed the same. It's still a 4% change. That's very important that you keep that in the back of your head here. Because even though we've increased my altitude, we've not necessarily made our probability of survival increase. So uh, that guy's uh, con uh, right back. Uh, pretty bad there. 60%. Four times. Again, the probability of hit on that last one was 1%. Now, the reason that's important is once we cross that threshold of 6,000, 5,000, 6,000 feet, the probability goes from four all the way down to one. Now, why do we need to know that particular piece of information? That's incredibly important to us because that tells us the magical altitude which to attack targets that are protected by flak. Now, in this particular target here, um, <laughs> we're about pretty high now. We're about 7,000 feet, and our probability is 1%. Whereas if we were like five, six, um, basically between 500 and 5,000 feet, our probability hit was pretty darn good. So one of the things you need to keep an eye out for, uh, let's go ahead and switch sides. We'll make a quick little adjustment to my scenario here. Go up to add edit sides. We'll grab red team here. We'll actually go ahead and add, oops, sorry, not red. We'll go grab uh, normal. So that way we can actually see all the things shooting up at us here. So if I were to grab, for example, an F-16 a CM block 52, I feel bad if something bad happens to this one. Press OK. We're going to go load it up with some, of course. Uh, let's see here. That would be a fun weapon to use. Good way to get shot down early, though. This is actually what I want. Uh, BLU, uh, that looks good for me. Ooh. So let's take advantage of everything we know. Let's kick him up to afterburner. Let's also, of course, reduce his altitude. We're going to put him down to 5,001 feet. It seems like an odd altitude, but it is the magical altitude here. And we'll see how hard it is for him to get through the gauntlet, so to speak. I'm going to go delete those last couple airplanes. We've already demonstrated well beyond a shadow of a doubt there what the safest altitude is, which is a little bit higher. So let's go ahead and set his properties here. We're going to drop him down to 5,001 feet, just like that. And we'll unpause. We'll go ahead now. Of course, we're a little guy. <laughs> his little sniper pods are like, uh-oh. Dun, dun, dun. This makes me uh, think of in the uh, Star Wars there when they're doing a little Death Star run. The guns, they've stopped firing. So now watch what happens this time. So we're exactly taking advantage of every bit of knowledge we have here. Actually, we should go a little bit higher here. We'll do uh, train following. So that way he actually climbs up to <laughs> 5,001 feet. And as we pass by, of course, so we're going to order him to do a couple attacks here. We're going to have him fire one at that one. And we're going to have him fire one at that one. And I just noticed we need to be at least 10,000 feet. Ah! Oh, well, you'll just have to use your imagination here when he does his little pass. So now we're going to switch back to the other team real quick. Go back to red. And now, of course, uh, they're getting ready to fire at an F-16, something that's going to be an easy target. All right, they're lining up their sights. The guy's about to squeeze the trigger. He's going to pull the string. And, of course, there comes the first one. Pause. Now, notice here that we are at the magical altitude. So we're a little bit high here, about 5,000 feet, which means we're no longer an 8% probability. We're a 4% probability. The other problem we have here is you'll notice target is at Mach 2. Effective flak probability is reduced by the same factor. This is the hit probability. Now, if I were to go ahead and run back down my little drone real quickly here, he's moving pretty quick. If we were to kind of make him, uh, let's put him up to 8,000 here, just a little tiny bit higher, 6,000 feet. We'll go ahead and edit him real quick. This isn't really fair for the guys taking pot shots at him right now, but again, this is just for demonstration. Let's do 6,001, and close it off. Unpause. All right, they're all taking their shots. Here comes the next one. And we can see now the probability has been reduced to a staggering uh, 1%. And that is what you need to know about all this, is that even though we have that new proximity fuse, once you create a scenario like that, it becomes basically impossible for this aircraft to get struck. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, does this work in reverse? Unfortunately, it does. So if I, for example, were to get a Cessna 152, uh, what do they do? C.152? I'm just going to do 152 here. To me, it's a C-152, dash but everybody's different. And we were to grab this little training plane, and we were to fly him through. Uh, this should theoretically be the worst case scenario here. Let's see what happens here. Get him going. I'll do a quick 15,000 feet in a Cessna 152. Who are you kidding? We'll grab him real quick. We'll drop him down. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like this is such a waste of a Cessna 152. And we'll also order him to go down to a loiter speed there because uh, we, we want to we make my point pretty strong here. So now if we swing back over to the other side, we'll notice that these guys have the world's easiest shot to make. All they have to literally do is control M, by the way. That cleans out the message log there. Oh, this is not very fair for my little 152 here. He's just, oh, how did that miss? Oh, probability fits still 4%. Oh, there's a range distance there. 
Uh, let's see here. Somehow we missed again. Seriously? He's a 152, man. Come. Oh, there it is. Let me go pause for a second. Now, the reason I wanted to pause is because I wanted to flip back over to my other side. And I just wanted to show you here that um, our weapon endgame here, very, very critical uh, damage. You can see that we lost our radio, but we took this little teeny, teeny, tiny hit here. So uh, we basically got nipped at a long distance. And that's going back to that new probability calculation. If this guy gets through, oh, oh, there's another one. Oh my gosh, he's just, oh. <laughs> I guess that's the end of that 150. It's okay though, it was a drone. There was nobody in it. And um, it had a bad engine anyway, so they need to get rid of it. But you can see here clearly the way that that works. So big takeaways here, uh, when you're doing attacks through any sort of flak, uh, speed definitely makes it safer for you. Uh, the next item that's uh, very, very important for you is of course, if you're going to be going through it and you have to go through it, keep in mind an altitude better than 6,000 feet drastically reduces the probability. An altitude better than 1,000 feet makes it a little less probable. Anything less than that, and basically you're asking for it. Uh, the other thing that's important takeaway here is if you do have a multi-engine plane, you're probably gonna get a lot further in life. Enjoy.